So then I suppose we will start off. And our, our firm coordinator is Patrick O'Neill, and he is now going to go through the training. Thank you. Thank you guys. Hope everybody had a chance to get a seven row. One of the few things that haven't burned lately. Flowers and lots of forbs that have you know all dominant grasses. 
what are the factors that are going to bring that all together. And so Ponza Prairie, when it was established, was divided up into all of these units that we call watershed units. And here in the green, we have areas where bison have grazed. Um, so there's bison fence around all of this. And within that area that bison are grazing throughout all of it, there are areas that are burned annually. That's why the one is there, burned every four years, or four years there, or every 20 years, with the 20 is there. And the A and the B are replicates. So this is an annually burned native grazed watershed. This is an annually burned native grazed watershed. This is just the A unit, and this is the B unit of the same treatment. So we've provided ponds up into these large scale watersheds where we can and have then track the changes that take place when we create this cyclical regime of fire on specified frequency and grazing or not grazing. The Kings Creek watersheds up here do not have grazing. The <laughs> watersheds down along South by 70 do not have grazing. Um, the C stands for cattle, so the east side along 177 has cattle grazing. And this has been rolled into a patch burn grazing experiment, which we don't really have time to talk about um, the patch burn, but there are three units that are all open together. And each year we burn one, and we kind of watch where the cattle are going to graze, where they prefer to graze, where wildlife habitat is then left, because we have structure that isn't all burned away, and, and it's that beneficial for prairie chickens, and we can ask a whole host of questions about small animals and everything else, in accordance with all of this. In order to have this understanding of fire climate and grazing, to tease apart, look at the interactions here, we have to have a prescribed burn program, which is what we're here this morning to look at, so that we can find out exactly what is going on with the fire? How is fire interacting with grazing? How are the two working together or, or, or creating these different, um, uh, these different ecosystems? For the purpose of understanding what's going on. We're not a management agency. We're not trying to make recommendations and tell ranchers they should be doing X, Y, or Z. We're just trying to understand it ourselves. There's knowledge that comes out of this, and that can be applied by people who may um, kind of so just a brief background into the, the jargon of what <clears throat> we're going to talk about. Um, a <clears throat> prescribed fire, when we have a watershed unit, imagine my green box here is one of those watershed units over on that map, so it's very irregular on the edges, but it's a lot easier to draw a box. So, <clears throat> um, we start out, we have a blue unit which goes counterclockwise and a red unit which goes clockwise, and we start a backfire. So the wind is coming into our faces as we're on that side of the burn. And we light the fire. We put it out in a mode fire guard where it's easy to control. We go down the sides of the watershed lighting a flank fire. That fire eats into the center of the watershed. Again, we have this nice mode fire guard on the side so that we can control and put out the fire in an easy spot. We come around and light a head fire, which is going to burn very, very quickly across everything with the wind and eventually it's going to blow into the area which we've already blackened at the very beginning so that we can zoom in. It's called a ring fire technique. It's um, a way to keep the intense part of the fire under control and keep us out of the heat. Um, we're not firefighters. We're not out here you know, battling blazes as often as we can. Sometimes we <laughs> do get away. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. But by and large, we are, you know, out here for a nice stroll in the prairie, we're walking along. There's some heavy work carrying drift torches and whatnot, but uh, the idea is to have a lovely, boring stroll in the prairie and watch some fire burn. So in this picture, um, the wind is very, very light on this day, so we see the smoke going up. Every picture from here on out, I want you to look at the smoke and think about where's the fire going, because it's going to explain what's happening in the picture. So we started a backfire on this side, over here, because we had a light south wind. This is just over the back of this hill here on a, um, a below ground plot. We lit a flank fire on this side, lit a flank fire on this side, and our head fire is being lit at the time we speak. So Eva took a time series here. So this is zero seconds. This is six seconds. This is 22 seconds into it with the head fire raging through there. 31 seconds. It's petering down, and 44 seconds. We are wrapping things up. The heat is died down enough that we can get in, put out the edges, and uh, it's all contained. We could not fight flames that are above our heads with the equipment that we have. So we rely on this type of a ring fire technique in order to draw that fire into a safe place that is 
surrounded from any combustible material. And uh, we can go on. What equipment do we use? Uh, our main piece of equipment in the lead is a tractor. I said we had a blue unit and a red tractor. This trailer is blue, so that's our blue unit. It's always going to be going counterclockwise. We'll see other pictures of it later, and we'll go outside and, and go over all of the uh, equipment that we have. But the main hoses that we use are going to be on the other side of this tractor. And the hose on this side is a larger diameter hose. It's a jump hose. There's a 300-gallon tank that we have for water. Um, let's see. We, using our, our smaller nozzles, we're going about 2.9 to 4.6 gallons a minute. So if we're using both hoses all the time, we have about a half hour of, of use for the amount of water that we're able to carry. We're generally not squeezing the handle all the time, so we can stretch that out. It takes generally longer than that to get around a watershed. Um, the breakaway hose can push closer to 50 gallons a minute in a 300 gallon tank. We don't have a whole lot of time when we use that. So we're using that when we're in a heavy situation that has uh, really, really intense flames. The truck units are our backup units generally, and they are set up exactly the same with the 300 gallon water tank. Our um, hose reels that we use most commonly are on the inside of this. This is a red truck, so it is going to be going clockwise around a watershed. Um, following the tractor, this tractor is facing a different direction because we're just getting started here and they're going to be um, going in different directions. So we'll talk more about that when we get out there. Drip torches. Um, I grew up lighting fire with a rake and matches. Um, we didn't have all this fancy equipment to contain things and fire guards. Generally, you burn ditch to ditch if your neighbors were willing to coordinate a burn. And you know we'd, we'd be able to use the gravel roadways and everything else to find things. Um, it took a long time to ride a flat fire with a rake because you're just dragging things along slowly. But our drip torches have a mixture of diesel fuel and gasoline in them so that it can uh, accelerate the, the diesel fuel burning, but it has a longer burn time. There's an air valve. We'll talk about that when we do our, our outside segment of things. It has to be tracked so the air can get in here. Um, the fuel control here is going to let a certain amount of fuel continually drip down. And as we walk along the edge of the watershed that we want to burn, we can kind of light the fire. This is Debbie. She's lighting on the outside of the fire so that we can get out of the way and the heat can pass. We have hoses over here. This is a, what kind of fire? Backfire, that's right, because the wind is blowing this direction right now. So the fire is going to slowly burn into the wind. So it's backing into the wind, which is the head fire, which is headed with the wind. Yes, sir. So what's stopping? Can you go back? Yep. Maybe. What's, okay, what's stopping that flame from going to the right? <laughs> so we have a hoser standing right here, and this is always the tricky part of a burn. Um, this is a narrow area. We usually like to have a wider fire guard than this, but it is mowed. So the intense flames that are going to be coming out of all of this biomass here um, are they're, they're going to be less when we're in the, the mowed area over here. So she's starting the fire out here. And there's a hoser. You can see the hose kind of coiled around. So right here, there's someone with a hose that is going to spray right along this line so that the fire in the mode area is going to get put out pretty quickly. And then we have that fire which is going to back into here. And the flames are, are going to be higher because we have a lot of fuel. But again, it's a backfire. And it, in going against the wind, um, things move uh, much, much slower <coughs> on the order of, um, you know, just a, a, a couple feet a minute. It's, it's, it's a very slow rate. So the flames, even in tall fuel, are going to be fairly low. So we're going to use the hoses and kind of stand right there put that out before we have any intense flames that are going to be trying to cross that. We'll talk more about the technique we use. Brakes and flappers. Um, when Kanza got started, we didn't have all of this, the trucks and tractors and everything else. So they would try and burn everything with rakes and, and flappers. I'm glad those days are over. I can imagine, uh, you know, growing up, just trying to keep fire on 40 acres was, was a pain when we didn't have any water. But we still need to use the rakes at times. Um, there are mower tufts where, you know, our Jim Larkins has mowed our fire guard, but there might get a bunch of grass there. We need to rake that out so it doesn't kind of smolder underneath of that and wind pick that up and mow it into an area we don't want later. 
Grapes always pull um, burning material into the area that you want to burn. Don't pull burning material out into the unburned area, because even though it might put it out temporarily, you're drawing fire into um, an area that you don't want. So here we're doing it correctly. There's a, a pile of grass down here that was cut and mowed. We don't want that near the edge of the fire guard, so we're going to rake that in. We can spray water on the top all day long. It wouldn't get underneath to where a lot of that heat is. We've got to break it out, make sure that that area around the outside of the fire has nothing burning near it, and spread that out. And those are located on all the units. Flappers, um, the name's kind of a misnomer. People think they need to flap the flames with it. Not at all. It's um, a thick piece of rubber. Lay that on top of the fire and smother the flames. Sometimes you stand on it, sometimes you just drag it along. If there's enough humidity and moisture in the ground, it works okay. If it's really, really dry, like we've had the last couple of days, it's not going to do much at all because the uh, ember is going to be able to um, hold against that dry ground and, and not go out. However, we've got a lot of people, and sometimes you need to run somewhere, you need to take care of something, grab a platter, it works better than your boots, generally. Um, I'm going to just do the shuffle, get things out. So they're there, we use them. I'll show you what they're when we go outside. Radios are a crucial piece of gear. We get spread out um, going around a, a big watershed. Yesterday we did a watershed that was 450 acres in size. Half the time you can't see the units on the other side. Your drift torches may be spread out a little ways. Um, we need to have uh, communication with people, especially if there's a dangerous situation, we need to call the better and whatever. If you are away from a truck or a tractor, we always have a radio one. And you are always in eye contact with someone that does have a radio if you, for some circumstance, uh, want to farther away. Emily's trucking right along, naturally, drift torching here. And Rosemary's having a great time too. Drift torching is a lot of fun, so. <clears throat> Let me try that last piece of equipment. Every time we go out in a watershed, we take our grain truck with two big water tanks on the back of it as our nurse truck. Again, if we have 300 gallons in here, we, at every opportunity, are going to fill those up. Even if we think, hey, we're not going to need very much water on this next burn, wildfires happen, and we have to be prepared for them. So filling up off the nurse truck is um, what we're going to do. This is Shelly. She's our uh, Crimson Drift Award winner this year. Other personal protective equipment. Um, we have yellow shirts that everybody is um, allowed to wear, they're, they're there to wear. We have full jumpsuits, if you don't want to get your duds dirty at all. Um, <clears throat> welding gloves are provided by Kanza as well as helmets. And there are lots of times when we get in the smoke and there are respirators available. These are not fire masks like firefighters would be going into a house with. They're more particulate filters. Um, they don't supply any oxygen, you're not carrying an oxygen tank. If you get into a really bad situation, which rarely happens, and we try to keep people out of those type of situations, but if you're right next to a, a raging head fire that's consuming all the oxygen, there's just not coming, not a lot coming in. Grass fires go quick. Um, don't panic. Your death is out of span. Don't panic, and uh, air will come back to you eventually. <laughs> 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 the ones with the face shield are the ones that I always recommend to people. I have uh, worse trouble with smoke in my eyes and can't, and uh, my eyes get watering so bad that I can't see anything. We have some of these that just have the face part to them. That's better than nothing um, if, if you're an asthma sufferer. But uh, if, you're, if you're worried about the smoke and you're in a heavy smoke situation like this, where here's my truck back here. We try not to uh, have our truck in the worst of the smoke. Sometimes they just have to be in a draw where we're worried about flames coming up and over a fire guard that's not very wide yet, and they just have to suck it out. So put on a mask and um, aim for one face shield if you can. And they're cleaned after each use. The face, the face masks are one of the few things that we take great pains <laughs> in cleaning after each use. And so they'll be wrapped in a plastic bag. And there's three sizes, large, medium, small. Um, so you can kind of consider what face size is and which one's going to fit face on your face. Shirts, I get pretty dirty. We might be burning five days in one week and we certainly aren't doing laundry every day. They're dirty. They're going to get dirtier when we're out there. You've got clothes underneath. So that's not going to be quite as clean. <laughs> um, we get out, we're working hard, it's hot, we sweat. Having electrolytes and, and uh, plenty of fluids is important. There's a cooler full of sodas that is for the crew, the crew. There's Gatorade on the tractors. There's water on all the units in jugs. There's white uh, paper cups. 
drinking water. See, so drink, drinking water, sorry, yes, drinking water um, for people to use. Don't drink the water out of the hose, it's kind of soapy. We, we use that's not stuff in there. And, uh, and, and salty snacks, um, you know, A, this is to keep people kind of happy and not grumpy. And some of us need some calories once in a while. Um, but B, it's a safety issue. If you are you know, hot, you're drinking lots and lots of water, you can have hypothermia. <laughs> Feel safe. And we certainly don't want that to happen. So enjoy the junk food that's on the on the trip. I never get it at home. My wife doesn't buy it, so this is usually my opportunity. <laughs> so the daily grind. That's the equipment that we're going to use. Um, moving forward into how we actually um, get things done. In the morning, I uh, I was going to take you to the Doodle Poll at this point and show you how we sign up for Burns. There's a uh, no internet connectivity in here this morning, and who's responsible for that? I kind of want to know. But um, there's a, if you go to the Consent Prairie webpage, you type in cons into a search engine, you're going to go to the first Consent page. It has a page for Keith, which you guys should probably know about by now, the Dose of Skewing Way. There's a page for the Long Term Ecological Research um, Group, which has data on our fires. If you're curious of when the watersheds have been burned, all the data is cataloged on the LTER website. All the management of things that are happening on the physical grounds here are on the on the prairie biological web position website. So go to the KPS web KPS web page and on the very front page of that there's a burn plan and a nice picture of what we're going to burn this year, the dates that we have burned things. Right underneath of that it says sign up to help burn on the Hunter prairie. So you can click that and it takes you to this doodle poll which you can type in your name, you can read the instructions at the top, and check all the dates that you want to be available to burn. When you sign up, that doesn't mean we're burning that day. That means that I need a crew ready to go every day. I'll wake up in the morning. I'll look at the weather. I'll see if this is a good day for the particular burning notes that we need to do. If it is, I'll post on there that we're burning today, so show up. If you don't see anything there, or you'll see me say, no burn today, um, you check in in the morning and say, great, I'm off the hook, um, and you don't have to show up. Um, if your name is on there, show up, because I need your help. I'm depending on... Uh, people who sign up to be there on the days that they said that they would be available. So I'll announce a burn time, start time on there. Generally, it's going to be between 9 and 11 o'clock. There may be short days due to heavy dew that we start a little bit later. There may be days where we're not expecting a whole lot of dew and we have a lot to do. Might start at 8. Um, but it's very, very rare. We've got too many chores to do in the morning. We really get a handy dew before, or no, before 9 10. So we show up, and I say meet at 10, and we're going to meet at this building down here, the, the shop, the fire hall, where the trucks are parked down in front of, the tractors all behind them, you'll see everything hanging out there. I've got a, uh, a pretty good core crew that has, pretty good, I have an excellent core crew that has been doing this for a lot longer than I have, and I'm gracious that uh, they let me be a part of, of running one of these sites. Um, Greg is in the back there. Where's Greg? Greg is the uh, crew leader that's generally going around the clockwise unit. It um, doesn't really matter which way we're going, but he and Jim Larkin, the shop foreman, are kind of heading up one direction. Tom Manslike, who's the site manager, the ranch manager out here, and I are going the other way, taking care of the other two units. Eva Orange used to drive in our tractor. Amanda Coles used to drive in the other tractor. Um, Myron and, and Chad have been great healthy and truck drivers. Gary Cole is a been driving truck sports. Um, Jeff Taylor is a technician out here, responsible for a lot of the bison species pump now, um, several other projects. So he's on staff. Shelly Wiggum is a grad student. John Brady is the director of Concord Prairie. These people show up every day. You will not see their names on the doodle poll because if I'm scheduled to burn, they're going to be there. It's the commitment that, that they've made um, to be there. <clears throat> I generally like to have a tractor driver, a truck driver, two people on the front hose, two people on the on the uh, truck hoses, and I want three drip forgers. This isn't to sign what people are going to do. We'll all switch around as, as needs are, are out there. So that makes an ideal crew of somewhere between 14 and 18, which means that I have six spots that I need volunteers for on every burn. There's a, a big group of people who have helped regularly. Um, several of them are in the room. Nicole's over here. She was a graduate student. Now she's um, working on a different project for a new lab. <laughs> Um, Drew Ricketts, the grad student, Chris Herring is a biology professor. Um, Jesse Sumerauer is an undergraduate, not even in biology, but she knows a lot about burning. 
China's here, she's an entomology. Jim Keller is a retired professor. Melissa Johnson's from CSU, she helped us out a lot last year. Um, John Blair, a whole bunch of PIs, which we see occasionally. Um, are people that, that fill those six spots a lot, but <clears throat> it's not really critical that it's filled by these people. I just need six people. I do need to have a crew that's balanced. A lot of these people are mature people, and they have burned enough that they're happy to let somebody else walk up and down and up and down and <laughs> up and down. And down, and down. <laughs> so keep in mind that if you do come out, it is it can be physically strenuous. And, um, and we encourage graduate students especially um, to come out to get an experience of, of what burning is like. But a lot of it is we just need some youthful legs as well. Um, so we get to here, we have our meeting, we talk about what we're going to burn. We head up to the top of the watershed that we're going to burn, starting on the, the upwind side, downwind side. Um, and we'll split the crew into two groups. Each of us will go to our clockwise tractor and truck, or our counterclockwise tractor and trucks. And then we will start lighting the fire. So we've got a gravel road to burn along the side of here, which is nice because you don't have to use any water. But we need to have a wider black area than this. If a head fire came ripping across here, we'd probably just jump right across the road and burn things that we don't want to burn over here. So we have multiple strippers lighting fire so that they'll light a short head fire section that's only going to go two feet. It's going to get put out by a small black strip here. The third person in line is going to wait till this person is well ahead so that they're not putting any head fire, head hot fire on them. They're going to light maybe next to the tall edge of the grass, and it's going to come over. There's very uh, different circumstances that dictate how we're going to do our stripping, if we're going to do it at all. Here's a flank fire. Um, it looks like it's a, a back fire because we have a little bit of smoke coming this way, but we have a lot of smoke um, that's just kind of coming over because of the topography on that side. So here we've got a flank fire. Um, the wind is generally blowing straight back behind these guys, and the fire that they're lighting is, is drawing in together and widening out this nice black buffer. So if we have a head fire come through later, we have a big, wide black area um, buffed out. A lot of times we're doing short areas. We um, don't have three strippers available on a shorter crew day, and so you may be going back and forth and back and forth. So Greg went along and he lit right here, and he turned around and he came back and he turned around and he's, he's lighting um, short areas. Generally, we're going to light fire that's half the width of the black. This is awful narrow. Okay, we're just getting started. But if you are a second or third torture especially, you need to always be looking at your flames, saying, what's happening to my flames? Is the fire going where it's supposed to go, towards the black? <clears throat> are the flames curling over the black more than halfway? We don't want any fire out here curling over more than here. If it curls over farther, then it's just going to jump the, bear, the black area that we're trying to widen out. Hills are fire, um, extra work, and uh, the fire can really accelerate with um, topographic effects like this. And so we're going to widen this hill out um, a long, long ways, all the way out to here. So we may spend several minutes and several people stripping, um, widening that out. If we have a nice gravel road and we're next to a bison area where they have completely trampled and trash things, and it's all nice and mowed, we don't really have to uh, be as concerned. We can light a lot wider strip than the second strip. We would never do something this wide if we were out here in tall grass, or we had grass here, or we had something over here that uh, was flammable. But here where we have nice areas, we can go ahead and uh, quicken the pace a little bit, make things pretty wide, and it will burn out uh, to uh, what we're doing. Um, I guess I my side. So we're going to go up and down this hill, widen it out. Um, a lot of rocks on these hills can harbor um, grass underneath of them, so we've got to take extra care to uh, get underneath of all of the rocks so we don't have anything nice in here next to the edge. When you're done, torching. Yeah. Blow your torch out. And we found out last week, it works a lot better with the shield up. <laughs> Everybody does this, and, and you have your helmet on to keep the, the heat off your face. They do a great job of uh, really reflecting a lot of that heat away. I often start to beat burn season with a beard, and about halfway through, it's, it's just getting all crumbly and ashy because the heat just kind of melted. So I gave up on I gave up on even trying. And, uh, and anyway, use the face shields, but lift them up so you can blow your torch out. Well, in gloves, really heat resistant. You can just wrap your hand around the top of the torch. 
then suffocate it as well. If you're a not windy person, um, that's probably the best method to use. So I threw this one in here because it was a great picture that Bart took, and you can kind of see we have a track, a, tra a tractor here, a truck here. Um, the fire is going this way, so we're lighting the flank fire right now. The back fire is on this side. We've got nice flames that are going to move in towards the center. We'll let the head fire and it'll all come down and, and be contained. There's a stripper here and a second stripper, I think. Maybe in there, I can't really see. And the truck that is on this side is just right behind here. So here's a person with a hose who's just kind of making sure that everything is out as a secondary backup plan. <laughs> if you are stripping, Winds change, which is why you have to be ever vigilant that the fire is going where you want it to go. And if you are in a tall grassy area near a hill where we're going to get winds that, that pick up near that hill, you need to have an escape plan. Um, so if you are second or third torture, then you're probably going to be maintaining contact with the people here on these hoses. So this is me, Eva says, and this is Drew, and so I can hello, yell over to Drew and I can walk towards him. And he can make me a hole so I can get out of these tall flames without uh, burning myself up. It's scary when tall flames are coming towards you. Do not run into the middle of the water. So it's not going to get any better in the uh, Always run towards somebody with a hose. They are your, uh, your lifeline. If you have a hose in your hands, um, you're going to be, if you're volunteering, you're going to be doing that just as much as anything. Um, the most important thing is to not use it when you don't have to. Um, trucks rarely are using much of their water. They're a safety backup. We want them there um, for when things go wrong, and we need them there, and they catch little things and keep little things from becoming very, very big things. If you are on the tractor unit, the first hose is really the one who's putting out the leading edge of the fire. The secondary person is mopping up any little things that the first hose missed. If there's a gravel road, the fire's going to go out. Don't put any water on the road. <laughs> Um, this is a really pretty picture, and I know that Shelly, who's standing right behind here, was just helping uh, Eva get a nice picture of the hose. It doesn't really do any good to spray your hose up into the flame. <laughs> usually, usually. If we have tall fire in a place like this, this is where your question was earlier, how are you going to keep that from jumping across there? Um, in these small plots, it does get a little um, intense at times. If you want to knock flames down, shoot the base of the flames. You're probably not going to soak the grass enough to put everything out, but you're going to dissipate a lot of that energy. Um, same story. If you need to knock down flames, squirt here. And uh, it'll, that energy of the water evaporating will take away some of the energy of the flames. There are instances where, yes, it makes sense to shoot things in the air. If there's something glowing, floating over the top of your head, <laughs> wherever this lands, could start a fire. And uh, certainly, we don't want that to happen. So Bart got a great shot of this. And this sort of thing does happen. Um, last week, we had something probably like this go almost 100 yards after we had things wrapped up and done. And you'll see my neighbor's hillside back here, all black. Uh, it can happen, but this is the instance, or maybe a, a tornado that's uh, got a lot of glowing stuff in it, where squirting into the air makes sense. We're generally using the yellow hoses, the smaller half-inch diameter hoses. If we are in really tall grass where we do not have a, a moat fire guard, we can pull out the jump hose and use a lot of water to knock big flames down really quick. This is between uh, 177 and a fence. We didn't have any mowing. We wanted to make a fire guard all the way down to the highway. So we pulled out the big hose to deal with these big flames that we couldn't do on our normal, nice, manicured fire guard. <laughs> um, using a lot of water on cow chips makes sense. We're going to spend some time in grazed areas kicking lots of cow chips. And it seems like this is kind of an exercise in futility. But uh, light winds especially pick up and they get a little dust. And, and these things have been smoldering for a little while. And they kind of get loosened up. And they can blow over and sit here and smolder in an area that we don't want to burn. On the other side of the fire guard, they, they roll right on over there. I'm pretty sure Gene picked this one over there so that you can get a picture. But nonetheless, it happens. And we uh, are going to take extra diligence to spend some time clearing all of the uh, bison chips, the cow chips, away from the fire guard so that 
<clears throat> they have farther to travel, and the likelihood of them causing problems is uh, less likely. Once we get our flank fire done, we'll wrap around the top of a watershed, and we'll have our two torches that are headed to each other. The fire's wind's blowing this way, so they're lighting a head fire, and this fire is going to back very, very slowly across the fire guard. Our tractor's right up the top of here, and we have another tractor right over behind the bottom of the picture where this is. So we don't want to have our units right there where all that intense heat is. I mean, it just it melts you. So we're going to let the fire pass with the head fire, and then we will go back. Once, uh, once the heat is, is less intense, and uh, put out the little remaining stuff that we have left in the fire guard. And of course, it's tradition to uh, cross the drift torches once you meet up in person. <laughs> After a burn, we have to get ready for the next one or prepare for anything unexpected that might happen. So during breaks uh, between burns, we usually burn multiple watersheds in a day. We need to refill the drip torches so we have plenty of fuel. We need to uh, go back and top off the nurse truck. And then we'll have to ride somewhere to the next unit. These toolboxes are not for sitting on. A, um, your rear will dent the top of them and they won't open right. B, you're in front of the tires, and <coughs> we don't want anybody to get caught under the tires. Sitting on the fender here is just fine. Um, your feet kind of dangle, and, and yeah, they're rubbing against the tires, but you're not likely to get run over. Standing on the back or sitting on the back is fine too, so long as the tractor driver can see you. If she needs to back up, and you've got your legs dangling here, she's nothing like that. She wants to know um, where you're at, so you can stand up here. Whenever you're working around the trailer, go around the back. Try not to spend any time in front of the uh, trailer. If the tractor wants to pull forward or has an emergency and needs to move fast, you're going to get stuck, and we don't want to run anybody over. Uh, the trucks, it's great fun to sit on the top of the trucks. And uh, you have a nice view from up there. A lot of times, if we're going very far, we don't want you on top of the trucks. It's, you know, a fine thing to do for short places when we're out on Kanza, if we're going to be going on a highway or on McDowell Creek Road or even all the way out to the other side of Kanza, um, especially early in the morning, it might be cold. It's just not as safe of a place to be. So, sit up there when it's safe, but use your own judgment. We don't want anybody to get hurt, and there's times when we try to discourage people from riding up there, especially when we're going up and down the steep hills. Whether you're on a tractor or you're on a truck, um, Everybody gets off at the base of the steep hill before the truck gets up. Lots of times the trucks don't make it the first time, and you know, they're going to slide backwards. And the truck driver wants to focus on driving the truck and getting it up there, not on uh, making sure that people aren't falling off and bouncing around um, capital way up the hill. This is our bird plan for 2015. So, like we said, things are on different cycles. Um, the four year burns are going to burn on a staggered frequency. Not all the four-year burns burn on the same four-year cycle. One year four A may burn this year, four B may burn next year, four C may burn next year, and so forth. So each year we have a new map that uh, gets put together to say what are we burning this year. We coordinate with researchers to say if you've got stuff out there, you need to either pull it or protect it. We're going to burn it up. <clears throat> um, we're about halfway through right now. We've got everything along 177. We've got everything along the north side done. We did K1B yesterday, which is a big one. We need to get the bison units done and the south side stuff done along 177 left. Um, that's probably going to end up being about four days worth of burns. And I haven't posted all of the days that will be burning. I'm waiting until after this training so that if there are people here who want to burn, you'll have an opportunity to sign up. The sign up sheet has a tendency to fill up pretty quick. Um, so if you're really, really interested in it, get on the dutiful. Put your name down, and as you see things open up, put your name down. People who withdraw because they have other conflicts. So if, if it's full, keep looking at it. There probably will be an opportunity that uh, you can get out here. If you're desperate to come out here and it just doesn't work out, and every day that you want to come has um, a full crew, um, send me an email, and we'll see if we have a, a day where somebody else is going to show up. Somebody on the poor list had a had another opportunity, and I'll put you on my uh, my uh, backup. At the end of the day, we refill and fuel all the units. Um, they're ready to go again in case of wildfire. We return all the gear to where you got it. We'll talk about where we store that when we head outside for too long. And sign out on the sign out sheet. There's a sign in and a sign out sheet down here. We want to make sure that everybody who went out made it back in. And uh, you're not still out there you know, going to Pharaoh. 
the number. <laughs> uh, like I said, emergencies do happen. And uh, the most important first thing is to make sure everybody else knows that we have an emergency. If it is a fire emergency, um, get on the horn of the vehicle that you're in, three long blasts, just do that help signal. Um, call all of the crew leaders on the radio, make sure that they're aware of what's going on. And if we get into a situation where we're going to fight a wildfire, fight it from the black. You do not want to be in the grass with a fire racing towards you. So we will fight from the backside and fight it on the flanks from inside on the black so that our equipment is not going to get burned up. Fire is moving away from our equipment. <clears throat> and, uh, yeah, figure that out. Ten pounds, I'm sure. Emergency procedures, we have um, medical situations that uh, can arise. Some people get sick. You know, you get a lot of smoke and it can make you nauseous. You get out there and you're sweating and you don't realize it and you just get exhausted and you need to sit down. We need to know when we have people who are not able to function in their jobs. Um, it's not a bad thing. We need to switch people around. We need to know when you get close to your limit. And before you get to our limit, just tell us um, and we'll switch you out. You can sit in the air-conditioned cab of the tractor. You can sit in the air-conditioned truck. Um, get some clean, fresh air for a while. All of us have been there. Um, you know, it's, it's nothing to be ashamed of. We just need to, we need to know and we need to take care of it before it becomes a more serious issue. First aid unit, first aid kits, uh, along with AEDs are on all the trucks. Um, if we have a major heart attack, um, we have equipment that hopefully is going to keep you alive. My uh, uncle in Topeka really wanted to be on the burn crew. And he's a mortician, so I thought he's going to cover our bases for us. <laughs> <laughs> I was on fire that there was some complications with the lawyers and so forth. That that was so we have AEDs, we have first aid kits. It doesn't have to be a major emergency. You don't have to be having a heart attack to get into a first aid kit. If there's something that you know you need, a band-aid, a bandage, um, some neosporin, some burn cream, we got a minor um, burn, we'll take care of that and uh, just take a break and, and get out what you need. If you're going to stop the, the whole unit that you're on, you need to let the crew leader know so that we can anticipate um, that uh, we need to hold up a little while. If we're not around, um, wildfires happen because of lightning, wildfires happen because of cigarettes thrown out on the highway. We have a code orange system, which is our emergency contact list, and it has all of the phone numbers of the people who uh, are going to show up in the events of a wildfire. We have this split up into uh, the head leaders that we would call first. That first person is supposed to call everybody below them. Get everybody out here as fast as we can to deal with the wildfire. County does respond, rural fire does respond to Conda. A lot of times they're quicker and, and they're beating us to um, lightning strikes. That's fine and well. We want to be here to help them. If the county is here, we consider them um, in charge. We'll work with them. But uh, we've only had to institute this a, a few times for major wildfires that were spreading across the but it is there, and they're posted everywhere. It's also a nice uh, phone book. You ever need my phone number? Find it in code orange. They're everywhere. Other considerations um, when we're out burning. There's <clears throat> waivers for anybody who is not associated with Kanza uh, for uh, KC Division of Biology, K State, that you'll need to fill out so that we can say that we're not responsible for you. Um, but it is limited to the crew that needs to be out here. If you're signed up to volunteer, great. I'm happy to have you out here. Don't bring a lot of friends. Don't invite people to come watch. Um, these are my kids. I brought them out here last year for training, and they had a fun time watching the, the fire. I would love to have them on the burn crew with me, and they would love to be on the burn crew with me. <laughs> but uh, it's not going to happen for uh, quite a few more years. So keep in mind um, what it means to be on the burn, burn crew. It's, a, it's you. It's not other people and we certainly need to uh, be considered. We have school kids out here a lot of times with, with Keith. Um, Jill looks at the burn, she sees what we're gonna be doing, but <clears throat> keep in mind, there's a lot of kids around here, short people, especially if you're driving a vehicle. Drive slow around something. Photography, very um, discouraged. When there are instances which Eva or John Briggs allows a photographer to come out in some insinuating circumstance, um, we do our job, and we ignore them. They can 
take their pictures. They're not taking pictures of you. They're taking pictures of fire. You don't do anything silly. I, I say that up here. I'm a bit of a hypocrite because all of Eva and, and Jill's pictures are of me doing stupid stuff. But, um, <laughs> but nonetheless, if somebody comes out, they want to take pictures, they're on their own. If you see them engulfed in flames, take a fire blanket, wrap around them, we'll try and help them. But by and large, they are doing their thing, and we're just going to ignore them. If they feel like standing inside the fire ring, or the fire, <laughs> that's, uh, that's their business. And uh, yeah. hopefully they know what they're doing. This particular person does. This is Brad, who uh, used to be on our fire crew, and, and now runs the fire crew up in Nebraska. There are bison in areas that we burn. Um, the bison burns are very patchy, and the bison always have some place to go. We're not going to engulf a bison in flames because there's no intense flames generally in the bison area. The bigger concern with bison is that they get really excited because burning means there's green grass out there and they're going to have something to eat. So they start jumping around. Um, we have never had serious incidents with the bison in person. Don't. Uh, don't change that statistic. Stay, stay well away from them. Realize that they are wild animals, and um, and uh, don't you know try and ride on the ocean. <laughs> so that's where we're at um, with the general procedures of what we're going to be doing while we're out during the burn program. Um, we'll take a, a little break. <clears throat> People can have another seminar or go to the bathroom at about uh, I don't know five after or ten after. We are going to split up and uh, go over the equipment that's outside. Um, it, I've got it pulled outside. This is inside last year. Does anybody have any questions so far? <laughs> so, um, if you guys weren't doing these prescribed burns, just nature was taking care of this pasture, how many lightning strikes would be happening? Is it roughly the same of what you're doing? Are you kind of mimicking nature, or are you? Um, yeah, so there's there's a whole lot of factors that went into the historical fire frequency. Um, you, know, you can read Lewis and Clark journals and talking about the Indian setting fire and, and Lewis and Clark setting fires. And <clears throat> so man has been involved in setting fires a lot. Lightning strikes, um, we've had, I don't know, six in the last five years, maybe. Um, the difference now is that because we have fragmented the landscape so much, and we've had a lot of landscape change. A lightning strike fire now is going to probably not extend more than a couple hundred acres at best. Whereas before, a lightning strike fire might cover seven square miles or, or more. So um, there's natural fires that, that happen. We originally, when we set this up, thought that four-year burn frequency was probably the historical norm. We found out that four-year burn frequency is the most mortally invaded. Every four years, we're stimulating the shrubs um, to, to grow more, and then we give them plenty of time to recover. Um, part of that is, is seed source differences from where we're at now versus you know where we didn't have a lot of the seed presence that could respond so fast to those um, calm intervals between fire. There's a lot of factors that, that go into that, and we're not. I mean, preservation is part of our goal but we are not specifically trying to um, recreate a specific time period when we say that we're trying to preserve the prairie. I know our, our main focus is understanding how the different frequencies of fire are going to interact and understanding how they're going to result in, um, in different ecosystems, different assemblages of species and, and animals. And so it, it's different than it was historically, and we're not going to go back to the way it was historically. In prior preservation, you usually have a target. What is it your goal is? We don't have a goal so much as the goal of a specific prairie that we want to create, as much as understanding along the way. And so we have everything divided into one, two, three, four, and 20 year burn cycles now. We had 10 year cycles, and uh, we got rid of those. Um, we're trying to decrease a lot of the less frequently burned prairies because um, prairie preservation is um, an important goal of ours and a 20 year unburned prairie is not a prairie anymore. Finding that out. And so there's there's a lot of those where Nature Conservancy is encouraging us especially to you know consider preservation um, a little bit higher on our priority list. And so we're <coughs> increasing the frequency. If you wanted to maintain an open grass two to three years is probably you know the, the 
the minimum frequency, anything more than that, you're probably going to have. So back in 1840 or whatever, a typical plot of ground, do you think it was getting burned every two or three years? It, it's probably likely, or even if it was only getting burned every four or six, those fires were, were, were big and expansive, and the seeds weren't there for the woody species to come in fast in that time frame. Okay. They're here now, and so we certainly know now that we need to burn a little bit more frequently than maybe we need to burn before. There's some speculation on my part to say that, but um, that's, that's certainly what we're seeing out on Kanza with our, our burn time. Yeah? It was on a slide, but you didn't talk all the way to the bottom. No synthetics when you're out there. I didn't say that. That's a good point, Myron. Um, when you come, and we've got our equipment for you. Um, you're wearing cotton jeans, Nomex clothes. Nomex is synthetic, but it's non flammable. Um, clothes that are, are non combustible. If, you, if it's cold and you wear your nice polyester long underwear and you're in the heat, those are going to melt right into your skin and it's, it's not going to be easy to uh, clean that off. And, and, um, no synthetics. Cotton, I like to wear two layers, so even though I've got a yellow long sleeve shirt on, a lot of times I've got a cotton sweatshirt on underneath of it, or a long sleeve cotton shirt underneath of that yellow fire jacket as well. And, you know, closed toed shoes at a minimum, boots I highly preferred. All right, when we um, are going to reconvene, um, we've got a lot of people, and I want people to be able to see what is going on with the uh, equipment. So if you're on that side of the room, or you're in the back row, I'm going to have you go to the blue units, which are down in front of the shop. And if you're in this cluster right here, you can go to the red units, which are up, up the hill from the shop. And we'll, uh, we'll say 10 minutes, so 10 minutes to 11, kind of convene towards the respective red or blue side, and somebody will go through all the equipment with you and talk about how we're going to do it, where it's stored, and get out of the Just one minute.